Now, if we continue with NIST's input on cloud computing, and this comes to us from a document we'll be quoting a lot, and that's NIST's publication 500-291. We'll talk about that in a few more minutes. But the five characteristics of cloud computing. So cloud computing, you know, people misuse cloud computing, um, that term, because it's a very popular term. So per NIST, it, it's only meeting the cloud computing standard if it provides access to these five resources or these five, if it has these five characteristics, okay? First of all, broad network access. We're utilizing the internet to access cloud services, most likely. So we've got that large amount of network access that our internet service provider, our cloud carrier networks that we're gonna have. We shouldn't be um, uh, bottlenecked by bandwidth the way we've traditionally been. You know, if you're connecting into my organization remotely, uh, you've, you know, my, the amount of bandwidth I can provide, the amount of functionality from my servers I can provide, we're not worried about that anymore because we are taking advantage of this huge pool of resources now at our fingertips, so to speak. All right, that on-demand services idea, boom, when you need it, it's right there. You ramp it up, you take advantage of it. And then when you don't need those services, you don't have to pay for them as well, right? So I can uh, provision 100 uh, servers, spin them up, but I can also take them down, take them offline as well. I can use applications in the cloud just as I need them. And again, this idea of metered service, meaning I can pay for the resources that I need without having to pay for resources I don't need or that I'm not using. And that, in turn, kind of goes into rapid elasticity. Scale up, scale down, scale up, scale down. I need a whole lot of resources here for the Christmas holidays. And then I don't need as many resources after the Christmas holidays. So that elasticity allows me to grow very quickly, but also to shrink back as needed. And yeah, you see that many of these characteristics kind of feed into each other, right? So that's exactly what's going on when you see this slide. You know, you start off with your on-demand self-service. You have access to the resources you need. Um, that broad network access isn't going to be a bottleneck or isn't going to be a hurdle to present. You've got the pool of resources as necessary. You pay as you go and you can increase and decrease as necessary. So those are the five requirements for the cloud computing. Um, and again, that's from NIST. Now, as we move into why, why the cloud, right? We know the cloud, the cloud's the answer. Every company knows the cloud's the answer. They're just not sure what the question is. And I say that a little bit joking because when there's a trend in technology, everybody rushes to keep up with the trend but the problem with that is that trend doesn't necessarily solve, necessarily solve a problem that everybody has, right? So we want to make sure when we're looking to move to the cloud, we can benefit from the resources that the cloud provides us. And I'm not in any way somebody that says, meh, cloud. No, I think the cloud is tremendously valuable. But I also think that sometimes organizations jump to the cloud without fully understanding the elements and thinking the cloud's going to solve some problems that it won't. All right. So when we talk about drivers to the cloud, and you can kind of see this little chart in the middle, why cloud computing? Many of these things we've talked about. We've talked about the idea of pay as you go. You know, some of you may use Microsoft Office every single day. Some of you may use it once a month. Why should the person that uses once a month pay the same thing that somebody that uses Office every day? So that idea of pay for what you need. And that can um, impact total cost of ownership. The next bullet point, lower TCO. But even bigger with that, you know, we're looking at, I no longer have to house the resources internally. Um, and again, depending on which service model we use, I may save more money than others. But even with software as a service, I no longer have to play the game of keeping up 
my client software and my client hardware. You know, there was a period of time where processor speed would double every uh, 12 to 18 months. So here you go out and you buy a Pentium 100, yeah, I'm a little old school there, and then the Pentium 200's out in a few months, and if you're going to keep up with the cool kids, you got to upgrade. And look how much RAM we have available in our systems today as opposed to what we had years ago, right? So just continually having to upgrade hardware, not to mention software, you know, one operating system after the other after the other. Then we've got a patch. So, yeah, absolutely taking this hardware and making it someone else's responsibility having someone else provide the physical facility, having someone else vet the employees of the network team, all of that can result in lower total cost of ownership. What it definitely does is it provides a shift in capital expenditure to operational expenditure. Okay, that's one thing that you probably going to get is you don't have anywhere near as much upfront cost when you're um, using cloud services than you would if you were hosting these services in-house. So that's a big benefit. It does not always result in a lower to total cost of ownership, right? Because at some point in time, you own your resources when you're paying for them yourselves and hosting them yourselves. So when we are, you know, it's just like leasing a car versus owning a car. There are pros and cons of each. And we really need to make sure that we understand what benefits we're really going to get. Because to say it's cost savings or lower TCO is not always the truth. A lot of times we feel better with operational expenses than capital expenses. So for instance, how many of you, when you go out and buy a car, you found a car you like, it's $30,000. How many of you are going to go there and pay in cash? Right, And some of you will. I, I, I'm sure of that. For me, man, it is hard to see $30,000 leave my hands. That's just painful. So what do I do? I make monthly payments. It just feels better. You know, I, I don't mind seeing 450 bucks go out of my account to see 33000 Right, So it's easier for an organization as well because when you take that hit, perhaps of millions of dollars up front, it can really be difficult to show you know, that, that return on investment up front. It's going to take a long time. All right, and again, I'm not going to read you all of these, but I want to make sure that we get them. You know, um, uh, reliability, scalability, and sustainability – you know, what we're doing is we're turning that over to someone else. When we turn security, when we turn um, uh, redundancy, when we turn business continuity, when we turn all those elements over to someone else, that does not guarantee that they can do it better than us. And that's one of the things I hear over and over and over for business. They can secure our stuff better than us. Maybe right? There are very few guarantees. We really have to do a lot of due diligence when we're evaluating our cloud service provider, when we're looking at our needs for compliance to satisfy the regulations and um, shareholder expectations, industry standards. So the answer is they can handle it better than us is certainly not always true right? That's an easy answer. That's like saying, man, I have a problem. Let me just outsource it and that'll take care of everything. Hopefully we all understand that that's not really the way the world works. All right. Um, risk transference and reduction. I want to very much hit on this point because this is going to become a theme throughout the class. You can transfer risk. You cannot transfer liability, okay? You can transfer risk, you can't transfer liability. So when we're talking about this idea of transferring risk versus liability, here's the difference, okay? Now, I'm a health I'm a, a healthcare provider. Can you think of any laws or regulations that would pertain to me in relation to healthcare? HIPAA, right? 
HIPAA, I'm going to be legally required to provide for security of patient information. Well, let's say that I outsource this, that I, I take this information, this data, this patient data, and I store it into the cloud. The cloud service provider gives me an SLA that says they will protect my resources appropriately. Great. And then they don't. My data somehow is stored out of compliance with HIPAA and there's a breach and all that information is disclosed. So who's liable per HIPAA? Me. I'm the healthcare provider. Right? I am liable per HIPAA. Me saying, oh, but I sent that somewhere else. That doesn't absolve me of any sort of legal responsibilities. But what about the service level agreement? Well, the service level agreement means that I can transfer risk in that the cloud service provider may be sharing in the loss, right? They may have some share of the loss. I may have legal recourse to get some of that money back, but they're still, they're still not liable per HIPAA, right? I'm liable. Not to mention the fact that, that when my customers see this compromise, who do my customers associate the loss with? Me. So there's a difference in being liable versus having, um, so let me just reiterate that. I'm liable, however, I can pursue legal action to the cloud service provider if they didn't meet their service level agreement, but that's more about breach of contract than it is liability for the data underneath regulations and requirements. I hope that makes sense because that's a really important idea. You cannot outsource liability. Okay, so I think we've talked about most, you know, highly automated, sure, that's great. It frees up my internal resources so we can focus on the business. All of these are big drivers for cloud computing. 